Welcome to Simply by Grace, a podcast of Grace Life Ministries with founder and director, Dr. Charlie Bing. This podcast and other helpful resources can be found at our website, gracelife.org. Now, here's Dr. Bing. I'm glad you joined us for today's podcast. We're going through a special series called Simply by Grace, the book. When I wrote Simply by Grace, I never dreamed it would have such an impact and be translated into a dozen languages with more in the works. It's published in English by Kriegel, and you can get the book at our website, gracelife.org, or on Amazon, or wherever you buy your paperback or digital books. Like a lot of folks, you might want to buy a bunch and hand them out to people who need a better understanding of God's amazing grace. Grace Life ministers around the United States and the world sharing the gospel of grace with unbelievers and the grace of the gospel with believers. Our ministry is supported by folks just like you, and that too can be done on our website, gracelife.org. What we'll do now is read a chapter of Simply by Grace and follow that with an interview on the topic of that chapter with someone who's going to give further insights about that aspect of God's grace. So, if you're ready, we'll dive into the book. Chapter 6. Secured by Grace You are not grounded in grace if you do not believe in the security of your salvation. How can I make that blunt statement? Because if your relationship with God is not secure, not grounded firmly in His unconditional promise, then it is left to your imperfect performance, which is no basis for eternal security. Security means that our eternal salvation will never be lost or forfeited because of what we do or do not do. Never. If we cannot be saved by what we do or do not do, then we cannot lose our salvation by what we do or do not do. Those who understand grace and its implications will be confident of their eternal security. Since our salvation is grounded in God's promise and not in our performance, since it is a free, undeserved gift and not something we must earn, then we are secure. God's promise is sure and he cannot lie. Romans 3, 4 says, Let God be true, but every man a liar. In 2 Timothy 2.13, we read, If we are faithless, he remains faithful. He cannot deny himself. In other words, even if we are to deny our relationship to Jesus Christ, as the disciple Peter did, God is faithful to his promise to give us his salvation. A Widespread Problem There are good people everywhere, perhaps good Christians who do not believe they are safe forever. They believe that their salvation can be lost. This belief affects them in different ways. Some may not be troubled by that thought at all, while others live in fear and doubt about their eternal future. The possibility of being forever separated from God haunts them from deep inside, which may cause them to live uprightly, serve in church, or do whatever is necessary to prove to themselves and to others that they are saved. Yet doubt remains because performance is always imperfect. Those who believe that salvation can be lost often resent the teaching that it cannot be lost. I've seen a lot of emotion generated by this subject. The argument against eternal security is usually framed in this way. If you teach that we cannot lose our salvation, then Christians will do whatever they want. They will have a license to sin. I have found that those who argue this way are usually good people with sincere motives who want to see Christians live godly lives. The view that believers cannot lose their salvation is sometimes referred to as once saved, always saved. While that is an accurate description, it has been used derogatorily by so many for so long that it elicits more emotional response than reason. Let us think beyond pejorative labels. If, for example, our eternal salvation can be lost, some big questions are raised. What sins will cause a man to lose his salvation? Where is the definitive list in the Bible? How does a woman know when she has lost her salvation? How does a man get saved all over again? Should he only believe? Believe what? Because he's already believed in Christ as Savior, if he was saved at all. Should he turn from his sins? then salvation comes through something other than faith alone and Christ alone. How can a woman who does not believe in eternal security share the gospel with confidence? Her message must be, Jesus will save you eternally, maybe. 
How can a man grow confidently in his fellowship with God when he is not sure that his relationship to him is secure to begin with? You can see problems that are created by the view that salvation can be lost. That view instead seems to create many more problems than the supposed problems created by eternal security. The greatest challenge for we who believe in eternal security is to explain some of the Bible passages that appear to teach that Christians can lose their salvation. We will not be able to address each of those passages, but we can lay a framework that will help us interpret them. The Grace Solution The Gospel of Grace answers the above list of questions simply. Eternal salvation is free and unconditional, so it cannot be lost. If it could be lost, it would not be called eternal. The reason we can affirm our eternal security is not presumption or pride, but confidence in God's gracious promise. We've already seen how the book of Romans establishes that salvation is by grace alone through faith alone in Jesus Christ. Unconditional, undeserved grace is exactly that. It may be hard to believe, but God really is that good. To make the point that grace is undeserved and must therefore be received through faith alone, Romans 4.3 and Galatians 3.6 both quote Genesis 15.6, which says, Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness. These quotations look back to Abraham and the promise God made to him of a coming offspring who would bless the world and whom we would know as Jesus Christ. In both cases, Paul is showing that salvation must be by grace through faith in that Savior just as it was for Abraham. If it is through faith and not works, then the promise is sure because it depends on God's faithfulness, not ours. That is the point of Romans 4.16, which says, Therefore, it is of faith that it might be according to grace, so that the promise might be sure to all the seed, not only to those who are of the law, but also to those who are of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. If the promise depended on Abraham's performance, there would be no nation of Israel and no Messiah and no fulfillment of God's promised blessing through them. Israel's history is a story of rebellion and sin, yet God promised that all Israel will be saved and a future day of restoration because he will be fruitful to his promises. He cannot deny himself. Likewise, God has promised eternal life to all who believe like Abraham. That promise does not depend on our performance, but on Jesus Christ's performance. Jesus did the perfect and all-sufficient work. The Mountaintop of Grace The argument for eternal security climaxes in Romans 8 as Paul explains the results of justification and sanctification by grace through faith. A full explanation of the chapter is unnecessary to appreciate the main points. Consider how eternal security is conveyed by the truths listed in this summary of key verses. Chapter 8, verses 15-16 through 16. We are adopted into God's family with God as a father. Verse 17 We are heirs of God, recipients of His promise. Verse 23 we have the Holy Spirit as our first fruits or guarantee of the future redemption of our bodies. Verse 28. All of life's experiences will not prevent God's purpose for us, but will work for our good to accomplish His purpose for us. Verse 29. God's unalterable purpose is that all whom He sovereignly determined will be conformed to the image of His Son. Verse 30. All those God selected will be glorified with no exceptions. Verse 31. Since God is on our side, nothing can prevail against us to thwart His purpose of our glorification. Verse 32. Since God gave us the greatest gift of His Son to save us, He will also give us all the other things that will bring us final glorification. Verse 33. Since God has chosen us and declared us righteous, no one can reverse that with any charge of guilt. Verse 34, since God has accepted the sacrifice of his son for us and Jesus intercedes for us, nothing can condemn us. Verses 35 through 39, nothing and no one can separate us from God's unconditional love. All these assurances of our eternal security depend on what God has done, not on our performance. God's double grip. We can also look to the Gospel of John for assurance of our eternal security. 
Every promise of eternal salvation in John, in fact, states or implies a life given to us that is eternal. When God makes a promise to us, like John 3.16, that whoever believes in Jesus should not perish but have everlasting life, he will keep it. He attaches no conditions for us beyond believing that this promise is true for us. In John 6.37, Jesus said, All that the Father gives me will come to me, and the one who comes to me I will by no means cast out. The word all means no exceptions. If Jesus will not cast out anyone, then there is nothing any believer can do to make him cast that believer out. One passage, John 10, verses 27 through 30, is especially assuring. Jesus says, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish. Neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. My Father, who has given them to me, is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. I and my Father are one. In this passage, we are told that the believer is firmly in Christ's hand, and Christ is firmly in his Father's hand. This divine double grip conveys our preservation for all eternity. Again, it is not us holding on to him, but him holding on to us that keeps us securely saved. A father and young son were crossing a busy street. The father grabbed his son's tiny hand and told him to hold on tightly. When they reached the other side of the street, the boy said, I held on tight, didn't I, Dad? Yes, the dad replied, but I held on first. If salvation depended on our grip, we would eventually let go. Only God can guarantee our eternal future with him. And more arguments. Many other lines of argument as well support eternal security. Consider these truths from Scripture. Since we are born again spiritually, literally born from above, we cannot be unborn. John 1, 12 through 13, John 3, 3 through 6. Since we are sealed by the Holy Spirit, which means he guarantees our eternal future, 2 Corinthians 1, 22, Ephesians 1, 13 through 14, Ephesians 4, 30, that seal cannot be broken until its purpose has been attained. Since we are baptized into Christ and united with him, we cannot be unbaptized or severed from him. Romans 6, 3 through 5, 1 Corinthians 12, 13. Since God is a good heavenly father, he would never kick us out of his family, though he may discipline us. Hebrews 12, 5 through 7. Since all of our sins, past, present, and future, are forgiven by Jesus Christ and his eternally sufficient sacrifice, there is no sin that can cause us to lose our relationship to him. Colossians 2, 13 through 14. Hebrews 10, 12 through 14. Since we have the intercessory prayers of Jesus Christ and his advocacy when we sin, we are guaranteed that our salvation will be completed eternally. John 17, 9 through 12. John 17, 24. Hebrews 7, 25. 1 John 2, 1. Since the Bible speaks of salvation in the passive voice, like we have been saved, which indicates that the primary actor is God, our salvation is based upon his work, not ours. Ephesians 2, 5, 8, and 2 Thessalonians 2, 10, and 1 Timothy 2, 4. Since the Bible demonstrates by example, like Abraham, David, and Israel, and by precept that God is faithful to his eternal promises, if even when we are not faithful in our obedience, all of his eternal promises to us will be fulfilled in spite of our behavior. Psalm 89, 30 through 37. Romans 3, 3 through 4. Romans 4, 16. 2 Timothy 2, 13. What about those other passages? Those who do not believe in eternal security cite a number of Bible passages as evidence that salvation can be lost. There are too many to address here, but when interpreted consistently and correctly, each of the selected passages below can be understood in a way that harmonizes with eternal security. Here are some helpful tips for interpreting these passages. 
First, they must be interpreted in accord with the context that considers the spiritual state of the readers and the purpose of the author. Second, they must be consistent with the overarching plan of God to bless us eternally by His grace. Romans 4, 16, Ephesians 1, 3 through 14. Third, they must harmonize with the consistent teaching of justification by grace through faith alone, apart from works or any other merit. Fourth, some of these passages are referring to loss of reward, not loss of eternal life. For example, 1 Corinthians 3, 11 through 15, or 1 Corinthians 9, 24 through 27. Fifth, Some of these passages refer to God's discipline of believers in this life. For example, Psalms 32, verses 3 through 4, Psalm 51, 7 through 13, 1 Corinthians 11, 30. Six, some of these passages relate to the conditions and consequences of discipleship, not salvation from hell. For example, Luke 9, 23 through 26, Luke 14, 26, John 15, 6. Too often Christians will read these questionable passages through the interpretive lens of saved, unsaved, or heaven, hell. You can see that there are other options that render more accurate and meaningful interpretation. A license to sin? As mentioned earlier, a common objection to the doctrine of eternal security is that it is a convenient excuse to sin. After all, the objector would say, If a man is guaranteed eternal life, then he can do whatever he wants without fear of consequence. But this argument is weak for a number of reasons. First, an argument from a hypothetical or an unobserved experience does not determine the truthfulness of a belief. Second, while some who hold to eternal security may sin and excuse it, those who reject eternal security may do the same. Third, the nature of salvation by grace is that it teaches the believer to deny ungodliness and to live for God. Titus 2, 11 through 12. Fourth, new birth gives a person a new capacity for spiritual things, a new relationship with God, a new freedom not to sin, a new life, and a new perspective and orientation. Romans 6, Ephesians 2, 1, 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Fifth, the Bible teaches that there are severe consequences and loss of rewards for believers who live sinfully. 1 Corinthians 3, 12 through 15, 1 Corinthians 5, 5, and 9, 27, 2 Corinthians 5, 10, which is a good motivation to live a godly life. Do some people use eternal security as an excuse to live carelessly and sin recklessly? I'm sure they do. Jude wrote about ungodly men who turn the grace of our God into lewdness and deny the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. Jude 4. Paul evidently encouraged people who had adopted such reasoning and rejected it. Romans 6, 1-2. Romans 6, 15. While I know that such Christians exist, I cannot recall ever meeting one who uses eternal security as an excuse to sin. On the contrary, I've met many people who are so amazed by the grace that saved them and keeps them saved that they have gratefully surrendered their lives to God's service. Doing so is, after all, the only appropriate response to grace. Same old problem. The controversy about eternal security is nothing new. It is the same basic issue behind the problem that Paul confronted when he wrote his letter to the Galatians. In brief, Paul had preached the gospel of grace to the Galatians and they were saved. But now they were beginning to abandon that gospel for another. Galatians 1, 6-7 Soon after he left them, other teachers came and taught that it was not enough to simply believe in Jesus Christ as their Savior. They taught that the Galatian Christians needed to get back under the Jewish law to finish their salvation or remain saved. So by implication, they taught them that they had to keep their salvation by works or by obeying the law. Galatians 5, 1-12 In his letter to the Galatians, Paul shows them the inconsistencies of that view. Consider these points. It is not consistent with the gospel of grace that he had taught them in chapter 1, verses 6 through 10. It is not consistent with Paul's testimony. He was converted out of Judaism and received the gospel of grace by revelation, according to chapter 1, verses 1 through 24. 
He would not circumcise Titus, chapter 2, 1 through 5. He was called to preach grace to the Gentiles, chapter 2, verses 6 through 10. And he had confronted Peter for pressuring Gentiles to live under the law as Jews, chapter 2, 11 through 21. It is not consistent with how the Galatians had received the Holy Spirit at salvation, that is, through faith, chapter 3, 1 through 5. It is not consistent with how Abraham was saved through faith alone and received God's promises through faith alone, chapter 3, verses 6 through 9. It is not consistent with the purpose of the law, which was given not to save us, but to bring us to Christ for salvation, chapter 3, verses 10 through 25. It is not consistent with the Galatians' new position as free sons, not slaves, chapter 3, verses 2 through chapter 4, verse 7, and chapter 4 verses 21 through 31. It is not consistent with their early receptivity and hospitality toward Paul and his message, chapter 4, verses 8 through 20. It is not consistent with the liberty that had set them free from being obligated to obey the law, chapter 5, verses 1 through 15. It is not consistent with walking in the Spirit and the Spirit-controlled life, chapter 5, verses 16 through 26. In the words of the Apostle, to go back to relying on one's performance instead of Christ's finished work is to turn away from Christ himself, chapter 1, verse 6, is to set aside the grace of God, chapter 2, verses 21a, to make Christ's death in vain, chapter 2, verse 21b, not to obey the truth, chapter 3, 1, and chapter 5, 7, return to bondage, Chapter 4, 9, 5, 1. Become obligated to keep all the law perfectly. Chapter 5, verse 3. Be estranged from Christ. Chapter 5, verse 4. Fall from the grace that gives us full assurance of God's acceptance. Again, 5, 4. And become susceptible to the lusts of the flesh. Chapter 5, verses 16 through 26. The danger facing the Galatians then, and those who rely on their works to keep their salvation now, is the need to perform perfectly in order to keep God pleased. Paul's words in Galatians teach us why it is impossible and totally unnecessary, because we are accepted by God on the basis of the grace that comes from Jesus Christ, received through faith. Today, those who do not believe in eternal security usually do not teach that the Christian must keep the Old Testament law. But when they teach that certain sins or a sinful lifestyle can forfeit salvation, The problem is the same one Paul confronted in the Galatian church, that salvation depends on performance instead of God's promise. Eternal security is not an excuse to sin. It is an amazing insight into the depths of God's love and commitment to us, and an extension of the same grace that saved us in the first place. It is inconsistent and even contradictory to believe that we are saved freely, but kept saved by our own efforts. The extraordinary, unexpected, and undeserved blessing of grace is that it always exceeds our sin. But where sin abounded, grace abounded much more. Romans 5.20 It is simply amazing grace. Review questions 1. What are some potential spiritual consequences for not believing that salvation is eternally secure? 2. How do the stories of Abraham and Israel reinforce the concept of eternal security for the believer? 3. In what ways can we approach those Bible passages used by some to claim that salvation is not eternally secure? 4. How would you answer the objection that eternal security is a license to sin? Well, the subject of our chapter was eternal security, which is sometimes called once saved, always saved. And to speak to that, I think we have a great guest today. His name is Dr. Mark Haywood, affectionately called Dean by his students and colleagues because he served as Dean of the Grace School of Theology for a long time and now has been uh, graduated, we would say, to provost. (laughs) That's it. (laughs) If if that's I'm sure that's a step up. 
Oh yeah, no doubt. No so doubt. welcome to the podcast. Thank uh, you, I'm going to call you Mark because that's the way I, that, I've never been your student, technically. That's so I'm okay. going to call you Mark. Um, and Mark has studied at Grace Gr- School of Theology, getting his master's there and a master of theology at Dallas Theological Seminary. He also has a law degree and worked in industry with using his law degree. So you know he's a good thinker and, uh, and has something to say. And not only that, he has uh, pastored a church, no, not currently, but pastored a church for 22 years in the Houston area. All of that, with all the experience of teaching, not only here in the United States, but around the world, um, gives him a lot of experience in answering some of these questions that we might have about eternal security. So anything else you want to say about yourself, your family, anything? No, just uh, um, I'll add that I went to Grace for the uh, postgraduate, I should say the graduate postgraduate program, D-Men. So uh, not the masters, but got the masters at uh, Dallas. Oh, okay. You got the D men at at Grace School of Theology. Yeah, yeah that's mm-hmm. right. Um, yeah, yeah, got the THM at Dallas. Mm-hmm. That's right. Excellent. Okay. Well, you know that the the subject of eternal security is extremely important. I don't have to tell you that. Um, Absolutely. And you've been around teaching not only uh, online students from other parts of the world, but also in other parts of the world. Uh, has it been a smooth ride for you when you do that? Or what, and have you been running into some opposition to the idea of eternal security? Yeah, from time to time, not only uh, abroad, but, but domestically as well, Charlie. I've, I've run into, you know, some challenges there um, from time to time, for sure. Yeah. Uh, I, I find sometimes a, a pretty visceral reaction to it, like in Eastern Europe, but not so much in other places. Um, have you seen a pretty strong reaction to it anywhere in particular? Uh, I wouldn't say a strong reaction. I would say, um, you know, certain people dig in, uh, in certain areas because that's what they've been taught, you know, from a child. And so, you know, when they hear this new concept, basically to them, they, uh, they resist, uh, you know, until we point it out in the Bible and just walk them through the text. and typically. You know, after meditating and and uh, thinking about it, I, you know, they usually come back and embrace it. You know, so far. Okay, so you mentioned that some people are brought up in traditions that never held to eternal security, and of course, we understand that. And a lot of those would use the same verses to argue against it, and so forth. Um, but you know, I'm finding it that we call the view Arminianism, right? Mm-hmm. That that right. says you can lose your salvation puts an emphasis on man's free will. Uh, Why do you think there are so many uh, people, denominations, and theologies that reject eternal security? You mentioned tradition as one thing. Yeah, from from my encounters, it it seems that most of the people, um, you know, really kind of boils down to they believe that you can work for your salvation Um, because their, their argument is, you know, they compare themselves to somebody else. I had one lady I was talking to and she said, you mean to tell me, you know, I can do all of this and, and do what exactly what God wants me to do. And this person over here uh, won't do uh, what God uh, wants them to do, but yet they keep their salvation. And so when you really kind of boil it down, she really is saying in my mind that, you know, when she's working for her salvation and it's not a free gift. Um and and so that's that's the challenge that I see a lot of people. They they think from a uh, humanitarian or just a humanistic standpoint as opposed to thinking as God would think. So it really starts with the gospel that you believe. If you think that you have to, you, we all teach salvation by grace through faith. But the moment we add something to that, that's going to follow us through the Christian life. So that we have to keep doing something or not doing something in order Absolutely. to stay saved. Absolutely. So, so it sounds like some people just don't understand the concept of grace. And of course, they want to add their works to it. And uh, once they do that, they they lose, I think, any possibility of assurance myself. Uh, and of course, we're distinguish, distinguishing between assurance as the subjective side of eternal security, which is the objective truth. But if somebody truly believes in Jesus Christ, they're saved eternally. Um, and so. One of the biggest, you know, actually in Eastern Europe, there, there are 
places that call this the Western doctrine of immorality. Mm, They call it this evil doctrine because it encourages people to sin. It gives them a license to sin. Um, Do you think that it gives people a license to sin? And how would you answer them? Yeah, absolutely not. Absolutely not. Um, You know, first of all, I'm, I'm, I think that not only myself, but I think that all Christians should be positive. You know, they should look at life as the the glass is half full. Um, And to me, what you just described is looking at the glass half empty. Why would you think that it would be a license to sin? Why wouldn't you think that it would be a license to obey or to love God more or to, you know, live a life of holiness? And then, of course, there are a bunch of scriptures that um, tell us that we are to you know, flee fornication or flee this or flee that or deny this or deny that and to live this life of uh, holiness. And so, you know, we, we teach the whole, um, uh, con the, the whole content of God's word, not just, you know, the eternal security side, but there are a lot of other scriptures on the sanctification side that we teach as well. And that includes, you know, living a life of holiness. And so, you know, you, we, we have to be able to share that with people that is not a license to sin, but it actually is a license or, or a freedom, if you will, to obey. Um, yeah. And to I do like that word freedom. To. Yeah. Freedom mm-hmm. to obey. Yeah. yeah. It is. A, I mean, technically speaking, a person can do anything that they want. But let me ask you a question I often ask other people. Uh, do you have you ever run into someone who has said, well, I'm saved by grace, so I can do anything that I want, and I'm going to go out and do what I want. Never. You know what? I agree with you. Never. I've never run into anybody like that, and yet that is the main argument against eternal security. Mm-mm. Yeah, I've never heard that in all of my travels. Isn't that amazing? And, that and yet that's their main argument. But I tell people I run into thousands of others who use grace as an excuse to serve God Absolutely. or as a motivation to serve God. Absolutely. Um, when, when you, you know, Charlie, when you sit down, you know, and just think about the fact that Jesus laid it all on the line, he went to the cross, he took abuse for us, you know, he took, um, um, you know, nails in his hand and in his feet and, and the, the, uh, the death on the cross. And as we look back at the cross, we should look back at the cross with, um, you know, great appreciation but also uh, it should motivate us to want to serve him better. And then just to add to that, you know, we have rewards, eternal rewards that we receive as we serve him. So, you know, I used to listen to Dr. Anderson talk and he said, you know, it's basically two um, uh, areas where people are mostly motivated to serve God or to live a life of holiness. And he said, one, you know, to show appreciation for the sacrifice on the cross, but also, you know, to receive uh, eternal rewards. And so, you know, we try to keep that before um, not only ourselves, but those that we, we teach and preach to. Yeah, I think if we teach the doctrine of eternal security, we also have to teach the responsibility and accountability of Absolutely. the believer that there are rewards or the loss of rewards Absolutely. And, uh, and other consequences, perhaps even in this life, as well as eternity for our conduct. So we are accountable to God. Um, why do you think it's important for people to understand and, and accept? this doctrine, uh, the idea of eternal security and what, what kind of consequences do they face if they don't, if they reject it, how does that affect their, their, their Christian life or even their salvation perhaps? I think it's kind of, um, for lack of a better phrase, maybe two sides to the same coin, you know, on one side, uh, if they embrace it, then I believe that they um, live uh, a life of productivity, a live a life of serving uh, not only God, but serving God's people, uh, achieving um, what God wants them to achieve and, you know, living a fulfilled life. The flip side of that is when you, you know, don't embrace it or you reject it, you find yourself um, living more of what we call a have-to life or a life of drudgery, um, a life of disappointment. Um, And you're always looking over your shoulder. You never can be free to do what God wants you to do because you think that you're working for his acceptance as as opposed to his approval. We're accepted by God once we trust Christ as Savior, but now uh, he doesn't approve of everything that we do. And so we seek his approval, not his acceptance. 
And, you know, I kind of liken it to um, I was listening to a guy one time and he was talking about when they built the San Francisco uh, Golden uh, Gate Bridge. And he said that when they first started building it, you know, people were falling off and dying and they were behind uh, budget, behind schedule Mm -hmm. uh, or ahead of budget. I should spend a lot of money and behind schedule. He said, but one engineer got this great idea to put a net underneath the bridge. And he said once, you know, and people would fall, the net would catch them. And he he said once they did that, then, you know, productivity shot up. They uh, began to uh, get closer to uh, the schedule uh, that they were once out of whack with. And so people started to to be a lot more uh, uh, happy and and feel good about what they were doing. I think that's kind of like in life, Charlie, is that, you know, the eternal security is kind of like a net for us that we can live the life that God wants us to live without looking over our shoulders or without, you know, um, walking on eggshells and be productive like he's called us to be productive. It really puts a a whole cast on life. Like you said, Mark, Uh, I like the, I like the expression. uh, We live a want to life instead of a have to life. Yeah. Um, Yeah. We don't have to earn God's approval or keep his approval or acceptance. We, we want to just serve him. Because That's right. He loved us first. And so our lives are just a response to his love and, and the grace that we experience in salvation. Uh, what a different motivation that is. Uh, I can't imagine living under the fear. I mean, I always equate it to the family life. How could a child grow up in a family living under the fear that they might be kicked out at any time or find out they're not, their parents really don't care for them or love them um, yeah. or, and would kick them out of the family? That would be a very unhealthy environment. Very much so. So Very eternal much. security gives the, the secure spiritual environment for people to grow up in healthy in a healthy way and serve God. Absolutely. Um, so what might be some of the main arguments that you go to? Uh, we probably can't cover them all. I gave some in the chapter, uh, but what are some of the main Bible passages that you would use to convince people of eternal security? You know, sometimes, Charlie, I tell them, uh, I was teaching a a begin not a beginner's class, but a new members class uh, at our church one time, and it was a combination of adults uh, and um, young people. And uh, I brought up this uh, whole concept of eternal security, and I was uh, reading through uh, John three sixteen, and I asked him, you know, well, you know, I, t- I told him about the eter- eternal life, and then I said, you know, uh, how long is eternal? Mm-hmm. That was my question to them. Mm-hmm. And a little five-year-old girl by the name of Kirsten <laughs> was the first one that raised her hand. And I said, okay, Kirsten, you know, tell us. And she said, it's forever, Pastor. <laughs> <laughs> That's beautiful. And, I just, and so I said, you know, hey, if a five-year-old girl can understand this, none of the rest of you should have a problem. Mm-hmm. You know? And and so I, I remind people of that sometimes in d- dealing with John 3.16. I was in a class, uh, or oh, actually in the Philippines, um, at actually on the campus of Word of Life, mm-hmm. and I was right, teaching, man, yeah. um, and I uh, was teaching Second uh, Timothy um, two thirteen, you know, mm-hmm. uh, and um, you know I was teaching, you know, even if we stop believing, you know, God uh, remains faithful because He can't deny Himself, and uh, I had a student. That, uh, that, you know, he was so into it, he just blurted out, where can we find all of this information? You know, <laughs> and of course, it's in the Bible. You know, we're reading a, a passage of the scripture in the Bible. But, you know, so that's one of the scriptures that I uh, I go to, too. Uh, I read through your chapter. And, and of course, you know, uh, John 10, uh, 29 and, and 30. I think you call it uh, divine double grip or something like that. Double grip uh, of grace. Yeah, it's a pretty awesome concept. But uh, but yeah, that's one that um, I go to sometimes uh, just to let people know that not only are you in Jesus's hands, but you're also in God the Father's hands as well. Um, and so those just are a few uh, that I turn to. You know, um, I was talking to a young man, Charlie, that had gotten saved uh, in his teens had committed a crime um, and went to prison, got out of prison. And he was talking to me and he, you know, was convinced that uh, he uh, had lost his salvation. And so I was, you know, trying to explain to him that he didn't. And it was, you know, he was brought up in a 
um, a holiness uh, uh, family. And so, mm-hmm. you know, that's pretty much Armenia, right. Armenian. And so he, you know, they, um, he, so he thought that he had lost his salvation. And I, I asked him a question. I said, you know, when, when um, Jesus got on the cross, um, if you think of past, present and future, where were your sins? And so he, he couldn't, he didn't understand where I was going with that. I said, no, no, just tell me, you know, were your sins, you know, past to Jesus's cross, uh, present to Jesus's cross or future? And he said, well, no, obviously I wasn't born then. It was future. Right. I said, so when he got up on the cross, he got up on the cross for all of the sins that you would eventually commit. Yeah. And that's when he understood. Okay. I get it. And he started crying, broke down mm. crying. Wow. Yeah. So uh, that, that's a great, that's a great illustration or argument. Uh, Jesus knew what you were going to do. He paid for it anyway. <laughs> Absolutely. So we're not going to surprise him tomorrow by anything that we do. That's right. That's yeah. right. And I often and, use Second Timothy 2.13 also because uh, one of the main arguments against eternal security is what if somebody just totally gives up on the faith or walks away from it? Well, Hebrews, yeah. of course, has a lot of strong warnings if you do that. Right. Uh, but Second Timothy 2.13, that says that God is faithful. He'll still keep his promise even when we don't, we don't, uh, when we stop believing in his, um, that doesn't, we can not believe we're in somebody's family or belong to the family, but that doesn't change the facts. That's right. So, That's right. I like that yeah. passage. Yeah, I, I, I love it. Um, yeah, I, I use it, you know, in, uh, quite often in my classes uh, when I'm in this area. Yeah, it is as simple as John 3.16. If we understand the concept of eternal life, I love the illustration with the little girl. Um, so uh, so simple that a little girl can understand it, but so simple that millions miss it. Uh, <laughs> it just goes right over their head. Uh, they're mm. looking for something more technical or or deep or something. I don't know. I yeah, don't know. The, the people that I've run across, uh, Charlie, honestly, they seem to... Um, you know, put God in a human mindset where, Mm -hmm. you know, it's hard for them to see that they, um, all they have to do is believe, you know, um, they got to be more to it than that. It got to be something else that I got to do that I have to add. I got to give up something or I got to, you know, pray a certain way or go to church every Sunday, whatever. But they're always looking for, you know, uh, the, um, the burden being on them and not the responsibility on God himself. Yeah, that's a good point. Excellent. Well, Mark, if I can get a little bit personal, what does the doctrine of eternal security mean to you personally in your spiritual life? How does it make a difference to you? Yeah, with with me, you know, I go back to um, what I was saying earlier. I try to be, um, you know, basically a positive kind of guy. Um, And the, the idea that God accepts me you know, for who I am and won't kick me out of his family is very comforting, very encouraging. Uh, yeah. And it, it also is a challenge for me to, um, to, to every day get up and uh, remove the default of my sin nature hmm. and uh, replace it with uh, holiness, sanctification, and to strive in that area. And so, you know, it's a, it's a great uh, blessing. And, and, and it also is a joy that I get a chance to, that he loves me so much that I get a chance to serve him, even when I fall on my face, Charlie, mm-hmm. you know, uh, even when I just totally mess up or blow it, he won't kick me out of the family, but he'll pick me up, dust me off, sometimes maybe even spank me, <laughs> but, you know, love me in the end. I, you know, I was uh, fortunate in that, um, you know, I had parents that were very loving. And 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 I see God in my parents. Mm-hmm. I'll put it to you that way. You know, um, and the attributes that God had has, you know, my parents had. My mother would 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 spank you. You know, no. Let me let me, let me put it in in the proper context. We didn't get whippings. <laughs> we got whoopings. <laughs> but gotcha. you know what? After she whooped us. She would make you come over and sit on her lap and she would hug you mm. and, and kiss you, you know, uh, and there was never a time when you didn't feel loved, even in the in the midst of getting the spanking, you know, that's, that's uh, wonderful. and and that's, you know, that's kind of 
the 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 personal reality that I experience with God is, you know, that um, He always has, and I'll, I'll use a legal term. He always has my finest uh, interests at heart. Hmm. Well, I, I I love the comparison of God to um, your parents, which is, in in my opinion, sometimes people get confused about their eternal security and their assurance of salvation because they have parents, they have parent problems, parents mm-hmm. that rejected them or didn't accept them unconditionally. And so they kind of project that on to God sure. and, and they just never have learned that unconditional love. And so they live in that insecurity spiritually, like they did all their lives. Um, now, certainly right now, there's some people listening who probably have some doubts about their salvation from time to time. They, they're, wrestling with sin as you say it's our default nature i like that also they're 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 finding themselves really having a problem defeating some sin it recurs in their life or they've done something terrible a long time ago or recently uh and and they're wondering how they can really be eternally saved can you just speak a word personally directly to them sure one of the things that um you know, we teach a lot on is trusting Christ uh, as Savior um, and for justification. Uh, but the other uh, piece to that is we need to trust him for sanctification as well. And the more we can um, turn our lives over to to God and not try to handle everything on our own. You know, Paul uses a very important passage of Scripture in Ephesians 3.20, he said, God is able, and he says he's able mm-hmm. to do exceedingly abundantly above all that you can ask or think. Mm-hmm. And so my interpretation of that is God is strong enough to take care of whatever situation comes our way. He went to the cross, uh, Charlie, so that uh, we could come to him and lay our burdens before him. We carry so many things, as the songs would, song would say, needlessly. Oh, what needless sins mm-hmm. and, and pain we bear uh, because we don't carry them to the Lord in prayer. Mm-hmm. And so I would just suggest that whomever is listening, uh, that, uh, you know, if they've trusted Christ for uh, justification, trust him for sanctification, too, and take those problems to him, lay them at uh, his feet because he's able to take care of whatever situation you're going through. And there's nothing too big, too small that he won't uh, deal with because he wants to hear from us because we are his children. He loves us. He has accepted you. He has accepted me. And some things he won't approve that we do, but we are accepted in the beloved. That's good. And I love the reference to Ephesians 5, uh, 520. Oh 320, 320, 320. Uh, yeah, uh, about God able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think. And in, in other words, it, you can't even imagine how God's That's right. love and grace is so big and so uh, permeating yes. and, and so accessible to us. Yes. And I think people just have to struggle with this eternal security and assurance because their God is too small. That's right. But where grace abounded, grace mm. abounded even more. Even more. Even more Romans five twenty got that one right. <laughs> That's what I was thinking of. I think where to, sure. I got the five twenty from. Um, well, Mark, it's been a great conversation with you today. And thank you for your time. But I'm sure there's people who might like to to hear more from you because I listened to you preach recently, and I was I was I loved it. And uh, is there that. some place listeners can go to benefit from some of your resources or messages? Well, you can go to. Uh, um, gsot.edu, and we have some of the uh, um, presentations on our website. Um, and so that's basically where you would go to find me and some of the other teachers and preachers at Grace School of Theology. Okay. gsot.edu, that stands for Grace School of Theology, where Mark's uh, present ministry is really centered upon. And he's done a great job for them. I know they really value him there. So, Mark, uh, Thank you for all that you do and all that you're doing. And thank uh, you for having forward. me. Yeah, well, I I look forward to the day uh, where we can minister side by side overseas, as we've talked about before. Also, I'm looking uh, forward to that. As soon as this uh, 
uh, cursed pandemic uh, <laughs> pa- passes and some of these countries yeah. open up. But uh, well, God bless you. And thank you for joining us. And if anybody is listening here who really likes this podcast, be sure to like it and subscribe to Simply by Grace podcast. And you'll get all of the series on the book Simply by Grace. Mark, God bless you until we see you again. Thank you. And God bless you too, Charlie. Take care. Thank Bye-bye. you. You bet. Thank you for listening. For more resources or to help spread the message of God's life-changing grace, visit our website at gracelife.org. We'd love to hear from you. Send us a message at simplybygrace@gracelife.org. at gracelife.org. See you next time.